Great, it looks like we're just having a few more people roll through here and we'll just get started in a few seconds here. Yeah, sounds great. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> Looking forward to your presentation. Thank Aww. you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you'll see, you'll see probably quite a few familiar faces here today. And so, so on that note, I think we'll actually get things started right now as we're just a minute past 12. And so first, I just want to thank everyone for joining us here today. I believe this is actually our last Food for Thought uh, lecture series of the term. And so uh, we're going to save the best for last here. And we're, we're very excited to have Ola Hirth join us today. But before we get started, I'd just like to make some traditional territory acknowledgement. Um, the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So with that being said, um, as you can see on the screen here, we have both members of Ola Hirath here today. We have Renee Struthers and Tanya Peters. And from there, I'm just gonna hand it right over to you. So uh, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we were actually scheduled to do uh, a talk, uh, Food for Thought talk in March, 2020. And I think we were the last ones of that year, but that also got canceled. So we're lucky and excited that we don't have to be canceled today. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. And it's an honor to be asked to do this talk um, today. I am I am Tanya Peters. <clears throat> and I'm Renee Struthers. <laughs> and we're the founders of Ola Hirith. Um, in getting ready for this talk, it has been helpful for us to stop and think a little about, about and think in some detail about our work and, and why it is or, or how it is that we do what we do. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what our intentions are through our work and how we find some, how we find our inspiration. We'll first touch briefly on our business name as uh, many people have questions about it. Um, Ola Hirith is a, is a combination. Is it working? <laughs> we're just on the first slide right now yeah i don't know why it's not changing here well, you want to you stop sharing what? and then reshare your screen for a second sometimes that just resets okay it. that's that's great uh stop share and now everybody has to see my desktop Yeah, all the pages are there. <clears throat> Just take a second there, I think. There we, there we go. go. There that, we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Off and running. <laughs> um, so yeah, Ola Hirith is a combination of our two of the two business names that we had we each had previously. Uh, so I had an interior design studio named uh, Studio Hirith. Uh, so my, my father's side of the family is from the UK and Hirith is a, a Welsh word. And it's one of those words that's difficult to translate into English, but essentially it means a, a longing from, for a place from your past or maybe a place that, that doesn't even exist. Uh, it's a, a feeling of being home. And this feeling really resonated strongly with me. And I found that, that it was a word that related to design, to designing spaces and, and to placemaking. Yeah, and I, I previously had an interior design business named Studio Ola. And I spent my childhood in Brazil and Ola is Portuguese for hello. I liked I liked that Ola had a natural simplicity, and it was it was a really it has an, a relatable and invitational quality, and it evokes a sense of beginning. I wanted to use the name um, that referenced Brazil because spending time there has had an impact on my design sensibility, and I admire the use of of their use of natural materials and plenty of color and ceramic tile and and the easy connections made between the interior and exterior spaces. Uh, together, we like the way the two names evoked a wide range of feelings uh, about our design ethos, the simple and the immediate, along with the ephemeral and the abstract, um, the tactile, along with the phenomenological and the present, along with memories of the past and plans for the future. Um, and so to, to begin, let's go there. 
You okay? Keep getting stuck. I wonder here. if you need to admit someone. I know maybe it's not us that needs to do that. Oh, sorry, it hasn't unit. We can see the hand moving. It's just stuck on the. There we go. We've we've seen the. We're on to the next slide now. Yeah, yeah. It's just it, it keeps getting stuck, but okay, it's okay. Um, to begin, there um there is a there's a quote by American writer Annie Dillard, and it states, "How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives." Upon a reflection of what we wanted to talk about today, we started to look at what it is that we do and we realized that as interior designers, our work is all process. Um, while we have the goal to finish a project and to complete our design and hand over the keys, the entire involvement, our entire involvement in the project from the beginning to the end is all process. And so we wanted to spend, it, so it's how we spend our, our days and it's how we spend our time and we live in that process. And so um, we arrived at this idea of process as place, indicating that the process where we are, um, that the process is where we are and it's where, it's our place. And we wanted to celebrate this a little bit. Um, the ultimate point of our process is to make place, um, to create highly livable places for people, for our clients and users. Uh, we hope to make spaces that are open and flexible enough to accommodate future influence on pl placemaking. We want to make places that can take on their own processes and places that can be remade again and again. And with that in mind, we also thought of the idea of place as process, meaning that we want the spaces we've designed to take on their own sense of place, to evolve on their own and be flexible to their own needs for adaptation. We try to be respectful of this while creating opportunities for growth and change within a space. And we do this by employing a strong base of simple forms and volumes, timeless and natural materials, and flexible and open-ended programming, among, among many other things. Um, we wanted to touch on a few examples of this, examples that show, showcase this evolution of place. And we'll start with this one corner in my kitchen. Um, my home is over a hundred years old and uh, built in 1912 and about 10 years ago we had some uh, water damage and one morning I, I came back to my home after they were renovating and they I noticed they'd ripped out our entire kitchen without warning and so we had to renovate it um, pretty quickly and our kitchen in this little corner there you can see that there's corner windows that have that are pretty low and so our kitchen not have not being very large um, with these really well windows, it wasn't functional to have typical height um, kitchen counters. And so we built a low L-shaped storage cabinet underneath these windows and put a butcher block on top. And it was primarily intended for storage and display a, a fruit bowl here or there. Um, but as our life has evolved and now includes two kids, this area has morphed into a wonderful perch for many aspects of life. Um, my kids are almost always on there. And when people come over, they also seem to find the spot. I couldn't have predicted all of its uses when I first designed it, but it was flexible and just the right placement and proportion to allow for endless repurposing. Um, so I'm going to uh, touch on one other example. Um, so uh, our studio, as, as probably a lot of you know, is located in South Osborne and we, we completed that build out in, in 2018. The space is very simple. We have a number of horizontal surfaces which have shifted and changed, changed over the last years to accommodate ourselves, um, to accommodate our growing team, our clients, our growing families, um, friends who pop in to say hello. And the simplicity of our space has allowed us to, to grow into it. Um, our small space has become a place for us and for our extended circle. Um, we're very aware of the limitations of, of our space. Uh, it's, it's not perfect, but it feels comfortable and familiar. Uh, it's activated through our involvement with the space, the things we bring into it, our bodies taking up space, our voices making sounds, the, the beautiful natural light that comes in. Um, and then the, the connection both visually and physically uh, with our neighbors. Um, we're so fortunate to, to share the main level of our building with, with three other inspiring female business owners, but, but more importantly, and, and closest to our heart are our other two team members, Katie and Lauren. Um, 
the building is a mix of, of public and private spaces, which uh, we knew that we wanted to connect through various openings with the design. So through um, large doors and, and um, window openings. And in this way, we, we feel uh, part of a larger place, uh, somewhat of a, a place within, within a place. And um, our processes have, have truly created place within the, the walls of our, our studio. Um, so, so now in, in a bit of a broader sense, we'd like to, to touch on, on our thoughts around um, what, what, makes, what makes a place. Uh, we'd like to start with this image to, to talk about that. Um, we feel that the, the building in the, in the center here speaks to placemaking in a way that the other two do not. Uh, the colors, eye-catching, the openings in the facade are slightly as askew. Um, these are ele elements that make it memorable. Uh, the front porch is welcoming and offers a refuge, a place of its own, and, and this makes it comfortable. Um, it is simple elements such as these that, that excite us and, and create curiosity in our observations and, and in our practice. And by comparing and contrasting our experiences and observations, we're able to understand what works and what doesn't work and, and why that is. Um, there is a quote by, by Lucy Lippard that states, Place is latitudinal and longitudinal within the map of a person's life. It is temporal and spatial, personal and political, a layered location replete with human histories and memories. Place has width as well as depth. It is about connections, what surrounds it, what formed it, what happened there and what will happen there. So as you know, places only made, made possible through human involvement. And this supports the, the critical role of the designer in understanding human interaction within space, um, including considerations uh, often of, of use beyond its obvious intention. Uh, we believe that place is only relevant to the extent that an individual has the ability to, to exercise a level of, of choice and adaptation over, over space. Um, so, so this example here is one that, that's really um, close to, to my heart as a, as a, a space for a strong, a strong sense, of, sense of place. Um, this is 546 Architecture's OMS stage, and I lived across the street from, from this um, place for, for six years, and I experienced its architecture in so many different ways. Um, it was, of course, a concert venue for my husband and I. Um, it was a bench to gather with friends to eat lunch. And then when our first son came along, it became a play structure. It became a, a space for, for playing hide and seek. Um, for his, his very first Easter morning, we, we hit our eggs in, in the, the voids of this stage. So I just feel like it, it's such a wonderful example of an interesting yet utilitarian structure that's just built in a perfect way for, for placemaking. Um, the realm of the interior allows for multiple places within one larger defined space, and our goal is to create many opportunities um, for this. We, we strive to create continuity and a respectful conversation between design elements, but we also want to create contrast and, and, and variety within those spaces to, to create different places for being. Um, and so in, in setting up the, op, the, the interior for this opportunity, uh, you know, we, we take into account the user's ability to adapt spaces to suit their needs. Um, and we hope to create comfort in space and, and just a real opportunity for, for placemaking. So uh, in designing spaces for people, we of course need to make sure that their basic needs are being met. Um, a comfortable bedroom might include a bed, a light for reading, a surface on, to on which to place your belongings. Um, whereas uh, uh, an area for enjoying a view uh, might require a space to recline slightly, a horizontal surface to place a book or a drink, as well as some padding for, for extra comfort. And basic needs of a space can often be met in a extremely simple way and simplicity allows for, for change throughout time and it also allows for, for adaptation. Uh, we are constantly inspired by the way in which simple design solutions open themselves to these opportunities. Um, we, we just don't need to go over the top since very simple solutions can produce a, a, a very strong sense of place. Um, 
these yellow bollards, for example, might become a seat for an informal visit. Uh, an arrangement of buildings and a courtyard become a soccer field with, with the addition of a bit of color and paint. Um, a pitched roof structure becomes an interior space with the draping of a, a beautiful textile. A collection of chairs might become a meeting room or seating for an impromptu performance or a make-believe train for a child. The built-in support above a doorway becomes a shelf to hold many useful everyday items. So as designers, we are naturally curious and we, we feel innately interested in the phenomenological aspects of our world. Um, we've always been observers from a multi-sensory perspective. And when forming the content for a project, we, we gather ideas from our clients and the context we're in. Of course, the, the project wouldn't work if, if we didn't do this, but, but we also gather ideas from, from feeling, from intuition, from listening, from taking things in, careful attention. And of course, our observations from, from our lives and, and from our travels. So we'd, we'd like to, to share with you some of our, our, our you know, main sources of, of inspiration and um, you know, how, we, how we relate this to, to the, the realm of the interior. Um, so we're gonna start with, with our inspiration that comes from, from the natural world. Uh, we take great inspiration from nature and we all spend a, a lot of time there. Uh, this inspiration comes in, in so many different forms. Um, we're inspired by the, the direct natural context of a given place, but also more generally in our observations and interactions with, with the natural world. We feel that nature provides the ultimate example of place, uh, places that are rooted, but that are always constantly shifting and changing through the seasons, um, through weather conditions, and also through human involvement. Um, in nature, place as process is widely evident and we find it so inspiring. Nature tells us what works, what lasts, what is beautiful. It teaches us about color. It teaches us about textures. It teaches us about patterns, shapes, forms, and, and balance. Our experience of nature dictates so much of how we think about the interior. We are moved by views that connect us with nature. And we're inspired by natural material, materials themselves um, and using them for the, the surfaces that we design. We're inspired by the endless multi-sensory experiences of place in the natural world. And we're interested in how we can translate some of those feelings into the interior, or at the very least create connections in a way that, that can bring the outside in. Uh, so uh, an example that, that we always love to use is our own Manitoba Tyndall stone, which dates back um, 500 million years. And, we just feel like the, the use of this stone on the interior um, creates a constant reminder of past histories and places and, and something that's, that's literally right, right beneath our feet. Um, so another major source of inspiration for us is, is color. And we, we try to explore the use of color in our projects as it can be a major driver for defining a sense of place. Most often our ideas surrounding color are inspired by nature, as Renee has mentioned, or collected during travel and other life experiences. Um, take this example of, take this example is of some yellow on the streets of Lisbon. Without it, there would not be much to look at, um, but these painted frames provide an opening to how we can begin to understand the space. The color draws us in, it's invitational. Even when we see that the doors are closed, we feel that we'd be welcomed into that space at some other time. It's a simple and an inexpensive solution and yet very effective. Renee has already discussed how we look to the natural world to help us define a sense of place and color is often a means of doing that. Color is everywhere in nature and it's un as, as unpredictable as it is predictable. This, these are flowers in January in Vancouver. <laughs> Um, but it's boldly present and we are in awe of its effects. 
I purchased my home on the day that, that the apple blossom tree in the front yard was blooming and, and it's, it made the inside of our home glow a really brilliant pink. Uh, for me, the sense of, my sense of home is connected to that tree and the, scent and the range of colors it brings into our interior throughout the year. In this Palm Springs home designed by Albert Frey, the color of the curtains are meant to indicate the continuation of the blue sky into the interior. And the color palette derived for our project in Lake of the Woods was exclusively inspired by the surrounding natural landscape. The wildflowers, rock forms, and pine trees, water, and sky all make their way into the interior space and produce a heightened sense of place within the interior. This is one particular color scheme that we in our studio are often drawn to. <laughs> um, and color can perform as a neutral and still add a lot of richness to a project. We painted the ceiling of one of our projects, a rich terracotta, and it feels like it's, it feels less like it's been applied and more like it's growing out of the architecture. It is located in the entry foyer of the home and the color acts adds to the sense of arrival and providing a welcoming effect. These colors have influenced other material choices that we've selected for the home. Um, but on the flip side, we love it when our clients are bold enough to want to engage in, in bright colors and in fluorescence. Um, through our observations, other colors embrace this a little more than we do. Um, this pendant uh, is seen, it was seen in Jerusalem and is made out of colorful plastic cups. <laughs> but at times we're able to do that here as well. And, and this is evident in the acrylic that we used in our neighbor, Tony Chestnut Studio. Our client for this project wanted to reuse the wood flooring from an old school gym. Each floorboard had strips of green, blue, yellow, and red painted on it, and we chose to match the yellow for the rest of the kitchen. Um, it speaks to a sense of place uh, made new in their, their home, but also is a reminder of the fun that had been had on that old gym floor. We put together a proposal for um, a, mar a market for, EQ for the EQ3 flagship store and thinking of the many people, uh, that many people in cultural backgrounds who might be filtering through the space. We wanted, to, we wanted it to be a beacon of color and texture all mixed together. We felt that color was the way, was the way to make it feel open and accepting. And so we're constantly challenging ourselves to find new ways of, of understanding how color works and we're always exploring um, how we can best utilize color to, to define place. Um. And another uh, huge inspiration for us is, is that of light and in, in particular um, natural light. Um, so light patterns, the patterns of the sun, the seasons, the time of the day, all of these have an impact on, on how we live our lives and, and how we approach the concept of place. <clears throat> Uh, living in a climate such as Winnipeg's where we're faced with such extremes today being a perfect example. Um, we believe that we have a, a, a really unique relationship with natural light, which creates interesting conditions in regards to interior space. Uh, we're able to bask in the warm sun from the interior, despite it being so cold outside. Uh, when we have the opportunity to determine the location for openings in the building facade, we think about the direction in which they are facing and what the quality of light creates in regards to the function of the interior space and, and the desired atmosphere. Um, the soft evening light filtering into the windows in this image uh, provide a sense of com comfort for someone who might sit on this uh, built-in bench that we've designed at the, at the end of the day. Um, the southeastern light that enters these large low windows at the front of this house inspired large window seats. Um, and these seats seemingly grow inwards from the facade of the home, which uh, create a perfect perch to, to bask in, in the winter sun. Um, this transom window uh, in this image will, will provide additional daylight filtering from the hallway into the, into the bedrooms. Uh, and this opening here was created uh, when an existing spiral staircase in the home was removed. Um, so during the demolition, the natural light would stream in through, through this opening, um, and we were just really taken by it. Um, functionally, this opening uh, needed to be filled, uh, but in this instance, um, the, the experience of, of natural light um, has inspired uh, a light fixture for, for that space. Um, so it will be kind of like a, a glowing diffused uh, light fixture that's currently in production. 
um, uh, here, the, the texture of the selected tile on this basement wall is subtly activated with the, the natural light that's coming in through, through the window. Um, so the, the, the subtle angles and curvatures of the forms that we design um, allow for light and shadow to tell a story on their surfaces, uh, a story that is, of course, slightly different um, every day and every, every minute of that day. Uh, as, the natural pro as a natural process, we love to think about sunlight and, and how it enhances place on the interior, but also how it reminds us of place in, in a much broader context, uh, you know, our, our place as, as a part of, of, of a larger whole. Um, another interesting part of our inspiration, um, collection of inspiration is thinking about past, the past histories of places. Um, with um, as mentioned earlier, our work uh, in our work, we're never the first to create place. Um, the sense of place doesn't begin or end with what we are proposing. Um, instead, we realize that our work in placemaking is a continuation and readaptation of previous places and spaces. Every place is layered with other histories, past lives, and experiences. And so, what do we do about making place when somewhere that's already had place? And what is our responsibility to that previous state, to those previous histories? Um, these are loaded questions, but they are ones that we like to reflect on during our design process. In, um... <laughs> in, in this historical project, our design intention was to bow down to the original architectural elements, the arched windows and the wood beams. Because of such strong bones, we felt that our design could be minimal and look as though it happened to grow out of the, the original architecture or their existing fir columns. Um, in another project, we wanted to pay respect to the original details of this historical Washington DC townhouse. We also wanted to infuse it with new personal histories. Our, um, our client mentioned that the wallpaper selected for the powder room reminded her of Nigerian textiles, a reference to her, her own family history. And a project can be helped along by what we discover under the walls and the floors. And we discovered, we discovered this, oh boy. go back to one. Oh boy, how do I go back? <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah, we discovered this beautiful insulation under, during the demolition stage in one of our projects, and we loved how it confirmed our thinking in terms of bringing some curvilinear elements into a largely rectilinear space. The house was built in, 1950, in the 1950s, and this has been a project where we've wanted to retain some of the existing uh, mid-century design elements while updating it to the current context. And sometimes what, what we find in the stripped down space, oak parquet floors and white walls is enough to feel like a place on its own. And the simplicity of what's already there helps us in deciding what additional aesthetic factors are necessary, if any at all. So in terms of the main decision makers for our project, we have a few. Our clients, they will have a wish list. Um, we as designers will have our own ideas, but the house or building also has a say in what it wants to be. And we really enjoy trying to find out what those messages are. We want to honor those past places and try to reference them in some way. Um, so I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit about, um, about how it is that, that we go go about um, ensuring that that we're kind of setting up the, the framework for for placemaking. Um, so we, we take great responsibility in trying to ensure that, that the interiors we design um, take these principles that we've we've discussed into account. As Tanya mentioned earlier, we we live in the process. Um, the process is our place. Um, to, to say that we eat, breathe, and sleep design is, is a total understatement, um, but this is our, our place of comfort, and um, we think that it, that it makes us better professionals, um, better mothers, and better contributors to, to society, as we're always trying to figure out the best, most comfortable, most beautiful, most functional way to do things. Um, 
this is rarely perfect, <laughs> but we also see this as living in the process and, and we really believe that, that, that there's always room to, to learn and grow. The process of making place is often totally unglamorous. And so we, we feel that it often gets overlooked beca because of that fact. Uh, it takes so much time and attention and we really spend the majority of our, our time here in, in, in the nitty gritty of, of the process. Um, when we design, we, we move from the macro to the micro, um, from the large concept to, to space planning, to specifications, um, down to the fine details of, of custom furniture and accessories. Um, we love to create perches, uh, benches, window seats, spots to rest. Uh, we like to have spots for, for green life to, to foster a connection to nature. Um, we like to design custom pieces uh, tailored to the spaces and the people who will be using them. Uh, we work really closely alongside our, our local community of, of builders and makers who, who are able to take our vision and, and make it all tangible. Um, we believe that, the, the, that this process requires a sense of care and we work in, an, in such a fast paced industry, but of course, within reason, we, we truly believe that, that design should not be fast. <laughs> We, we believe in slow design and, and taking the time to get things right, uh, as it's only then, only when we've had our, our eyes, ears, hands, and, and hearts open to the process that, that the design begins to sing. And so as a almost a conclusion, um, we, we wanted to show some examples of our work that demonstrate what happens when our part of the process is done. Um, we have images that were taken right after we completed a project alongside images that were taken many months after our clients have taken over. We wanted to demonstrate how the process of place evolves beyond our time. We don't want to be the final say on making these places, um, on the making of these places. We mostly want to facilitate the beginning of another story. These images to us feel celebratory, and we feel that's because our clients and users feel the freedom to explore and expand their own sense of place. We received a message from one of our clients recently about her home, and she referred to it as a home for living, which we feel is the ultimate compliment. Uh, we think that these images demonstrate the natural quality that occurs in a continually evolving place, places for, for living. Um. So we we'd like to um, kind of con conclude here uh, and talk a little bit about about our office lunch, the the lunch that we share together in, in our in our studio. Um, so if, if how we spend our days is is how we spend our lives, we'd like to um, just show this show this image. Um, we're busy in this work of continual process and in order for us to create the feeling of place for ourselves, uh, we slow down once, once a day to, sh to share a meal together. It acts as a moment of pause um, and a chance to, to take a step back from, from it all and to, to gather a bit of perspective. And, and we find that, it, that it's just enough to, to get us going again. Um, there's so many different ways to, to think about space and place and um, we feel so fortunate to be able to, to spend our life in, in process and um, working with our incredible team and uh, to, to always be propelled by the, the quest for, for beauty and, and placemaking. Um, so that's all we have for you today. And thank you. Thank you so much for, for listening along. Yeah, thank you so much for, for listening to us today. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. That was an absolutely uh, terrific presentation. And now now you've gotten me quite hungry as well by closing off on all those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that was, a, that was a, a very smart play. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you again for the, for the beautiful presentation. It's really great to for, see this insight into your design process. And, and thank you for kind of opening the curtain to uh, what kind of happens behind the scenes. Because uh, we often just see the, the final result and we don't see all this uh, beautiful inspiration that, that's come across with it. And so at this point, I would love to open up the, the kind of the, the table to any questions or comments. So we have a few ways that we can do this as well. 
If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to just raise your hand with the, the emote button and then we can, uh, can turn your camera on and we can see you and you can ask the question. If you're not comfortable with your camera on, feel free to just ask the question uh, through the audio. And if you're unable to do either, feel free to ask any questions in the chat and I'll gladly kind of just um, transcribe them to the uh, Ola Harith team here. So I'm just seeing a few um, comments that are just coming through the chat that I just wanted to mention. Um, you're getting a lot of thank yous and a lot of uh, stunning. And Emily says, thank you so much for taking the time to speak. Uh, this is one of the presentations that was actually requested by the students on multiple occasions. So um, it's really great to see some of the students out here today as well. Um, and Wanda says, wonderful presentation, Renee and Tanya. And so it seems like there's a, a lot of terrific feedback here. And so uh, one question that I may, may kind of ask or a comment that I may ask to get things started here is I, I really like that you use that term, uh, continuity and respectful conversation. Um, I think that was a really interesting approach to it, but I find it's also contrasted with this playfulness and this kind of childish like wonder. Um, it's, it's really terrific to see the, the inter integration of family within a lot of the photos and, and what feels like the design process. So do you find this to be kind of a, a difficult task when adapting space? You gave a great example with the Tony Chestnut one. Um, you know, if we have some students in here, how would you um, tell them or how would you help them kind of work with that idea of playfulness, um, you know, childish wonder, but still that idea of uh, respectful conversation and continuity? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think that you can't have respect without play in some degree. Um, I, I Not to say that one will trump the other, but I think that acknowledging, this, you know, the spirit of a place will always have something to tap into that you can celebrate. And um, yeah, I think that if you're not thinking about the joy of it, then you're missing the boat in some, in some way. Um, yeah, what would you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, that that's exactly right. And I, I, color is such a loaded um, loaded uh, feature of a space. And, and I feel like maybe maybe joy rather than playful is, is the word, but, but you know, very simple neutral, neutral materials can, can still speak to that, that sense of joy. And, and I mean, even in, in interiors when we're incorporating color, like I think that that there's still such a, a huge thought process that that goes on there that that has to do with continuity and and yes we inject color and often there there is a, a playful use of it but but that one you know piece will relate to the the next piece and and you know all of your your views from from one spot everything has to have continuity or, or else it just just really doesn't doesn't make sense so. <clears throat> I remember in what somebody during when we were in school had said it, a professor had said that if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> and I think that that's something I have to remind myself all, all the time because there will be moments when we're just slugging it out and then you kind of realize you're off to the wrong track track. And so whenever I try to bring that up by I think, oh yeah, this isn't fun. <laughs> it should be fun. And so finding a way to to make our days joyful um just produces something that I think other people will experience later on when the spaces are are there. And and um yeah I think that it's a fun it's a fun one to remember. Yeah I think the fun's very much reflected in the work. And so we have a, a couple of questions in the chat and then uh I have one question from Graham in the chat, and then we'll move to Sarah's question, and then another question from Owen in the chat. And so starting with the question from Graham, um, in addition to using the local limestone, how else, do pra uh, how else does being prairie people, and specifically Manitoba people, inform your design? Whew. Um, I think in so many ways, I'm just trying to distill it a little well, bit. Well, I, I, I feel like this is something that I have just constantly pondered, and, and you know, we are just we're we're such hardy people i think and and we really have to to search to to find the the intricacies of of our natural landscape and um you know that it's the the prairie landscape is not in your face like you you have to take the time to um to be an observer and i think that you know also what we were trying to say today is that that um, 
probably our, our, you know, our experience with the prairies makes us better observers. And, and we're able to, when we travel, see things in a way that, um, you know, perhaps if you're, if you're just used to everything being given to you on a, on a, on a platter that you're, you, you don't look at the world with, with that mindset. So, I mean, that's maybe a little bit too lofty, but, but I really feel like, um, we're we're inspired by our direct like our our direct um, context, and I think that 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 maybe shows up in our work with um, you know the the different um, design moves that we make. But I think it it also influence influence us beyond the um, kind of like uh, materials and and um, uh, physical features, and and really kind of is is in 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 the core of. I mean, Tanya grew up in Brazil. Um, I mean, you spent a lot, most of your life in Winnipeg, but yeah. but a chunk of your childhood in Brazil. So um, there's there's a difference there. But I think also here that like just there's something really simple about the prairies that I think is so richly complex too. And I I love I love yeah. I mean, our landscape is phenomenal, but it's just also so varied as well. And um, I, I mean, I think just like just being we're, we're people who get to be outside a lot. Um, when I think about how our year shifts and how we experience summer versus how we experience winter and um, even just like how we experience winter, mostly interior <laughs> inside. And, and so just trying to make interiors feel like something, but also because we have that summer experience, we get to visit a lot of different natural landscapes. And I think that having that that diversity in our visual experience makes for 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 our work to become exploratory in that way. Um, but I think the simplicity of, of the prairies inspires me all the time because um, I think that it can it can just be simple <laughs> and it can be good. So yeah. Great, that was a great question, Graham. I think we have uh, Sarah has her hand raised. So Sarah, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Nice to see you, Tanya and Renee. Um, okay. I just wanted, I was really inspired by your, when you talked about uh, the bench area in, in your home, Tanya, that was lowered uh, under the window. And I'm, I'm curious as to um, whether experiences like that, those sort of moments of surprise through sort of changing spaces unintentionally that become very used has changed sort of the way you practice interior design or how you um, sort of interact with um, sort of figuring out how people interact with space before you design and if it's influenced anything. You know, I absolutely, and I, I think like, I think we always ask ourselves to some degree is, will the space work if we're wrong, if our preconceived notions about it are wrong? And um, I want that to be the case. We want that to be the case. We don't wanna be coming up with all the solutions, um, but we what we notice about my bench is it's just, the like it's the right height for just lots of things and um and so almost just like kind of deferring to those wacky standards that it seemed boring but using them for in ways that aren't predictable will allow for <laughs> but if you're conforming your space to the you know the human body um it's gonna become useful in many many different ways and so I think that I, thinking about programming and, and planning almost kind of gets in the way of what the body can do. And, and I think that designing around that more often will allow for a lot more um, flow in terms of how it will be utilized in the future. But I mean, we, we, we also still need to plan for things. So it's, it's a hard place to be and we can't just plan abstract spaces that might work randomly somehow. But I think that thinking about lots of different opportunities firstly is nice because then you're already thinking about opportunities versus just like this is going to be a place where people will sit um, um I think that yeah that it just gets exciting to have that do you have anything to pick up? no I, I think yeah yeah thank you great thanks Sarah uh we have a question from Owen as well and his question is how did you land on the arc as a design signature I suspect he's referring to that, to that one slide that had the big arc on it would be uh, my suspicion. Yeah, I don't, I mean, like we, we love arches. Unfortunately, they're so trendy right now. So we're, we're like, how do we get away from the arch? Um, but uh, I think that 
originally, you know, when when we we start, I mean, arches have been used historically for forever. Um, but I think that that we're attracted to um, the curvilinear nature of an arch. It's a it's a it creates a softened opening, and there's something that that speaks to the to humans when you when you start to soften things. And um, I think really that that's we we really don't try and use <laughs> use it everywhere. It's just there's there's a lot of great opportunities um, for for using an arch, and I think that 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 that. I don't know. Do you have anything yeah. else to say there? Well, I I think I think that's it. And uh, we we also like it. We like not necessarily the arch, but we love it mostly when it has some relationship to some rectilinear forms too. And and trying to think about how those come together in a way that doesn't feel uh, predictable. And I mean, I think that at this point, it's that that shape has maybe become a little bit predictable. So we're now trying to figure out how can we if we're putting in an arch, can it be a three point arch? Yeah. Can it be something a little weird? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, we've, we've thought so much about how can we make spaces feel timeless and, and that's something we try to try to do. And, and it's hard when something gets marked in a, in a trend in, a, in that way. Um, but they've also been around for hundreds of years. And so it's an interesting, an interesting design element or feature. Oh, I, I agree. Uh, I can tell within the studio courses that the, the arch is popular these days. <laughs> oh, um, is there any other questions that anyone would like to pose within the chat or within the video? Just please place your hand up and I'll, I'll gladly kind of get you going there. Uh, in the meantime, I, I just wanted to note, I thought it was very interesting um, how you took the idea of kind of demolition leading to inspiration. Um, and that one instance, once you kind of pulled back the wall and you were able to see what was beneath, then that kind of um, informed some of the curvilinear forms. Have you uh, ever experienced that in any other projects or any other kind of notable moments where kind of the teardown process then later um, informed from, due to its kind of historical context or however it like pre-existed before you um, began to do renovations on the space? All the time. Yeah, I think all the time. <laughs> um... Yeah, and I like to different extents. Yeah. Um, I I think that like often it's not something that that you know we see it and then we're directly trying to apply it to where we see it like to that design. But I, I think that so often it's just um, you know getting added to the storehouse of of thoughts and ideas. I mean, we 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 at first thought, do we just do this entire presentation on on demolition photos because they're <laughs> There's so much beauty in in taking something apart, and I mean sadness um, for what you're losing, and also just from 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 a waste perspective. Um, uh, and I mean touching on that also, like we're we're always trying to think, like you know, are we creating something here that is going to have lasting value? Because there there is um, you know sadness around around taking it apart. But but yeah, do you have anything to add to the demo? No, I, I just think that I, I actually think it's hard for us because we'll we'll there's so many moments we'll walk in and rethink our th our original thoughts based on what we find, um, or or use them to confirm our original thinking. But I I think we're we're just so inspired by how people used to build too. And um, I mean, there's lots of places that are really old. And you know, in our home when we had to renovate, we found. Or it's actually, I should say this, it still is filled with insulation of newspaper from 1912. And you can read that newspaper. And I mean, it's just, there's lots, there's lots of just like, you know, we, we're, we're the built, the built environment hasn't started with us. And so trying to think a little bit about, or clearly it has not started with us. So we're just trying to think a little bit about what, what's there to begin with. And, and it's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> Um, I, th I feel actually one, one particular project was the Lake of the Woods project when we got to see it for the first time there mid demolition and there was a photo in this presentation of the fireplace and all of us were just like torn up about it and thinking well how do we how do we do that build this there again <laughs> but clearly the clients wanted their their cabin gone and so but we were like no <laughs> let's put this one back up there but it just seemed like such a really it seemed like such a beautiful cabin and and it, you know we're, we're trying to rebuild a new beautiful cabin it's this picture here actually but 
but it's hard. It's hard. You wish you could just do something on the side of that and have this other place that you can go that references other times, but this is our job. So we can't complain <laughs> about <laughs> what we do <laughs> in that way. So yeah, I guess it can be a, a difficult balance at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we actually have another question here from Taylor, who is a, an ED4 student in interiors. And her question is on your website, you have a few proposals. How much of your work comes from submissions like that? or how much comes from being hired from a private company or, or client? I would, I would say probably 90% of, of our work is word of mouth and, and referrals. I mean, Winnipeg is, is so amazing for that. Um, it's also just the nature of our studio. There's only four of us. So we do have a, a niche area that, that, that we're filling. We're not, um, we're not submitting for for a lot of proposals um and and there's two reasons for that like one is i think a lot of those those um jobs kind of require a bit of a, a larger team and and two i think it's it's just kind of not um it's not uh a lot of the, the work is is maybe not what we would be best suited to so um but yeah, I, I would say probably like almost almost all of our work comes from um, you know previous clients and friends and um, and now that now that we've been able to establish ourselves a little bit, people are able to see our work in in person um, through the you know um, the uh, commercial work that we've done and um, so. Great, thanks. And so just out of curiosity, how many years has it been now for, for Ola here? Uh, we started uh, spring of 2019. So no, is it 2019? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah, wow. That, that, that's, that's a lot of stuff from, from spring of 2019. Uh, yeah. And all of our COVID, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> we, we just kicked off and then we went into lockdown and to some degree, but um yeah okay so question about June so, so before before Ola Hirith, uh Renee and myself had had we were working independently so Renee had done June Supply before Ola Hirith came together but yeah good <laughs> good detective work there <laughs> so some, someone's up on the chronology yeah uh, exactly <laughs> yeah that's amazing like your guess is as good as mine <laughs> yeah. we got two celebrities here now so yeah. then i guess the, the the before we close things out what i would really like to to kind of offer up is any kind of last minute questions comments um you know it doesn't even have to be a question if you have anything else you'd like to say to ola here at, uh, today because we, we really appreciate your time and, and you coming down it was an absolutely terrific presentation so yeah isabella's been following you for a while so i, I bet there's a there's a few others as well that being said, um, do you have any kind of social media or anything else that you'd like to, to mention or to have people check out? Or is it mostly just the website these days? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, oh boy, everything is social media these days. We, we, we're we always like, oh yeah, we got to web update our website. <laughs> and, and we, you know, it's funny, we like, because of the, the pandemic, we feel like we went under major production mode. And so we have lots of projects that are, are about to be photographed in a, a more, official way and it's, for this project we didn't have a lot of pro photos for that were complete so it was I think that we're, we're about to get a whole bunch of pro projects photographed in which case we'll be updating the website when that's ready but um but yeah we love we love Instagram for the sake of just being a casual place to show the process of what what we're up to and it doesn't seem too fussy and uh it works really really well for that um yeah Great. Yeah. And even uh, Cynthia uh, mentioned to you that she she liked that you uh, focused on the process and didn't just show only the pretty images. So I think yeah. that that approach was was very successful, obviously. And um, I just want to thank you again for taking your time today and being able to provide us uh, kind of more insight as to what uh, Ola here is all about. So uh, thanks again, Tanya. And thanks again, Renee. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank, thank you, Jason. You, everyone. And thank yeah. you, everyone, for, for being here. Yeah. Yes, and thanks everyone for attending and for the questions and comments. And then uh, just to let everyone know, I believe this is our last Food for Thought um, lecture series of the term. We have the year-end exhibition coming up. Um, it will be online this year, and I think it can be reached at yearendexhibition.com. And the only other thing to note is, is that it's currently Winnipeg Design Month, and that festival runs from April 1st to 30th. So you can take a look on our University of Manitoba Architecture Events website if you'd like more information. 
Other than that, we're going to call it a day here. And thanks again for your time. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye.